Olga, thank you. Thank you not just for that invite, but also for everything that went in. Um, as you can guess, I sort of have an idea of what it takes to make things come out of uh, nowhere. And uh, it's a great pleasure. I already see many uh, familiar faces. Um, I'm going to start with the first uh, uh, third or so, uh, telling you what I'm, uh, how I would ordinarily do things so I can get to something that's uh, zipping along so that I can get your help on something. Um, I'm trying to work on something, and for the first time, the concept of collaborative spaces and how one works together, um, to me, seems a bigger risk than I've ever thought of it before. And, and uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to try to zoom along here um, uh, to get to, to a point where, if not just afterwards, during the day, if you want, please come up to me, because um, the last two weeks I've been really struggling on this. And I mentioned this to Tom Insel, who, as you may know, went from the National Institute of Medical Health to uh, uh, Google. I've talked about it with a couple of people, and I have yet to figure out how to get out of it. Okay, so ordinarily, I would go through this thing where I'd say, let's look at a glance to the past, and I would zip along and I'd talk about sort of themes that we had covered in, in various congresses. This one was the first in, in San Francisco. I might have gone and talked about approaches. Um, and one of the themes I usually bring up is the idea that there are all these awesome new ways of doing things, from collecting omics data to network modeling to uncoupling the linkage from those who make to those who can use data, um, through to um, movements uh, for patients and uh, open social media. I'm not going to talk about that per se. I am not, because I think some people who are aware of this sit there and go poetic on you on the difference between um, the absurdity of the state of the technology, the state of the institutions. I like to think of that as why. Why is that discontinuity there? Um, I might go and introduce the team. We've got about 40 people, we're about six years old, and uh, sort of talk about um, um, what it is that was uh, behind them. Often what I would do is to say, um, we do research on research. So we have about 40 people, we have no tenure, we have uh, no uh, for-profit motive. So we have this little think tank that we can go anywhere we want. And you'll see, we often, from year to year, those of a, uh, in the audience, uh, there are several of you, will know, we never look the same three years uh, you know, in a row. And so this, this is fun. It's fun to do this. And notice this phrase at the bottom where I say, conducted in open, collaborative ways, um, teams of teams um, and current guilds of experts. Um, in Paris, when I was there, I did this zip that I'll do here, which is, you know, this is the way most researchers work. Uh, if you don't believe that, come talk to me. The question is, why can't they do it that way? And I would talk about the technology platform that we've been building out called Synapse. I might even go and say, do you know GitHub? And I'd, I'd show some connection to GitHub and, and, and Synapse. And then I might have ordinarily taken the time to go in and now there's a dozen plus communities. It's actually thousands of projects that are going on on Synapse, where someone is doing this uh, in this area or that area. Um, I think I could get six or eight of you in the room to raise your hands, because I know you're on Synapse, and I know your groups are on, on Synapse. And at that point, I would ordinarily have gone to talking about challenges and uh, talking about how important it is to have people who don't realize their intrinsic value, don't realize how powerful they can add to something just because they don't have a PhD or MD or something behind their name. And these challenges have really uh, helped us. Um, they give incentivizing continuous participation, and that's a phrase which we can go into uh, at some other time. Uh, I like highlighting uh, the group out of Israel who's done this uh, beautiful stuff on Prize for Life. And, and I might pause and talk about the absurdity of how people who have problems with their health and in disease do not really act with themselves for those disease, but instead, I like this one as a concept of someone being a voyeur, right? This is basically how many people go through their life. When they go to a doctor, they pull back, they pull back from their responsibility of who they are and say, thank God, maybe someone will cure me, right? The priest will help me. And then I, I might glance to the future and, and basically talk about the fact that um, what I th think we're all trying to get to is a community where people will invest in places 
I don't know if it will be Stanford, um, that can train people capable of solving, and this is the phrase I think that's important, dynamic, complex, multi-dimensional problems. You cannot go in as someone who knows the innards of a cell or knows DNA repair or knows everything about mutations and get away from the responsibility. You should feel that that is a very small thread in the full problem. Right? It goes all the way up to politic, po you know, politics, to economics, and you should feel that responsibility instead of saying, this is uh, where I'm comfortable. I love making people uncomfortable. Um, and the, the ways to uh, allow people and to contribute to their health and how to allow them to build these ways out generally would have led, and this is where I would end my 30-minute talk ordinarily, in what actually has gotten me most interested. It's not how does a protein interact with another, the way I used to do biophysics. It would not be things about how you use expression profiles to do that. But these terms actually are, to me, much more important. Self-awareness, where are the incentives, what do you do with generosity, what do you do with empathy, than, than we usually put in. So what am, I, what am I going to talk about today? What I want to talk about today is the gap between clinical knowledge and clinical care. And what I want to put at the end is a paradox uh, between what it is that will happen to society from the use of emerging solutions using pervasive computing devices. So now I'm going to go over and I'm going to start talking about using pervasive computing uh, devices. And I'm going to show what you can do with those, right? And then I'm going to sh uh, ask you, ask us all, a so what? When I was training at the uh, Dana-Farber Harvard Fellow Oncology seeing patients, I was so excited because I thought that I had picked the area in medicine, uh, unlike neurology, where there was enough knowledge of what went on with a cancer cell, what was uh, the defect in the hematology pathway, this is the particular mutation that makes sickle cell disease. I was enamored inappropriately with the connection between the science behind what is going wrong in the disease and how care is done. Okay. Um, back then, you know, you'd say, oh, I'm going to give this patient, this is a patient with pancreatic cancer, I'm going to give this patient uh, uh, gemcitabine, this is gemzar. It's still, still a drug that is uh, being used. And when you go to look up and go, okay, I'm going to learn why we give that drug, there's this sort of mumbo jumbo about how it sits and intercalates in a nucleotide and therefore the cell will be treated differently in a cancer cell than a normal cell. And, it sort of, and you begin to go, whoa, 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 we don't really know why these drugs work. We just give, this is extremely important, we give them because someone did a clinical trial that showed a difference between one population and another, and an FDA approved it. It's not because of the science, okay? Science isn't driving it often. It's literally, can someone do a very big trial, say this happens, and can I go to that? So, in the last uh, 10 years, everybody's been so excited about precision medicine. Um, they've said, oh, we're gonna find all these mutations. So here's a list of all these mutations. We're gonna find all these amplifications, and now, all knowing, we're gonna be able to treat. Anyone who thinks that singular actionable mutations are going to be sufficient so to lock in key, thank God you have a BRAF mutation, I'm going to give you that, come talk to me. It okay? doesn't work that way. Okay? It's a great story, it's a great narrative, but it's not really uh, reality. I've been working in schizophrenia, Sage has been working in schizophrenia. There, you know what the drugs are? The difference are um, between, um, what is this description, uh, between FGAs and SGAs. You know what FGAs and SGAs are? I get all excited. First generation antipsychotics, second generation antipsychotics. This is my friend who runs uh, the psychiatry department at Oxford. I've been working with him recently. And John Geddes did this study, took 52 trials comparing antipsychotics. All the FGAs and all the SGAs puts it together, no difference. Is that real progress? Are we really going somewhere? We have fancy names, we have expensive drugs because whenever you get a second generation drug, you can just jack up an order of price what you're charging for it because it's a SGA. Um, right? So I think our uh, country is to blame 
for getting the public very excited about precision uh, medicine as it exists. Um, you know, it, it was personalized medicine. And then they did this little, woo, I'm going to call it precision medicine. And now we'll get this funded. And Obama sort of standing at the altar there, looking at the, you know, the equivalent uh, in the Greek Orthodox uh, church. It's called something like icons, right? Um, you know, looking at the double helix, right? We're going to be able to solve it. Eric Schott, a good friend of mine, a co-founder of SAGE, working at uh, Mount Sinai, um, got this into my head, etched this into my head. On the top is the proteins that are sitting in some sort of pathway, TGF beta going to this, going to that. That works well in uh, biochemistry books, uh, particularly if you have to memorize them, you can be you know, checked on whether you know them. But everything that we've learned in the last decade has said that there are intricate networks that are actually controlling when something happens, when something doesn't happen. And our understanding of those complex networks is squat. Um, Keishin will make a good insight. But the phrase, and I think you've seen this slide if you've seen my, I, I like Dutch uh, uh, woodblock prints. Um, you know, we are where the chemists were in the 18th century before the periodic table, okay? We are medical alchemists, okay? And until we have the principles by which we make the decisions, not when I do this, I get that. That's alchemy, right? Publishing a paper in Nature says, when I do this and I, I do that, I get that, okay? That's glorified alchemy, okay? That is not the principle. We do not have the principles that allow us to understand these rules. And I've been thinking a lot about what might you do to change that. In the last two decades, there has been a significant outgrowth, very expensive, somewhat helpful, of what's called genomic uh, data. So I, I count proteins through the, the you know, RNA, DNA, I count the microbiome, put that all in that green square and call it uh, genotypic data. But it's sort of interesting, we've gotten so excited about that, infatuated <laughs> with that technology, that if you ask, how often does that genotypic data match through to phenotypic data, we're in real trouble. And it was that problem that uh, led us to ask, how could we change clinical trials? So this, uh, which is part of a chapter, part of a book that I'm getting ready to, to write, is on how could we change clinical trials? How could you basically, you can say, blow up? revamp, whatever you want to use. The problems are that the clinical trials are, you, are, are carried out using clinicians' times um, with data owned by institutions, usually collected uh, using crude categories on a scale of one to five, pen and paper subjective surveys siloed by consents restricting shared data. What, what we want to do is to have a, a, a map that looks like this. When someone is in a normal state and they're going to be in a disease state, in order to make decisions and interventions, you'd like to do that. Okay? I love using my GPS to get from the airport to here. I want to do that for what's going on, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, whether it's cancer. I want to know what those maps could look like. And we have to figure out how we're going to build those uh, maps with those uh, dimensions. This is the heart of my talk. Those are equal, are, are individual um, things I want to talk about. It's not an acronym. I don't want it to be an acronym. Um, but the, these are the things that if we think if you could solve these, uh, that you could actually do clinical trials the way you want. And pretty clear, that, that refers to the number of uh, individuals that you're looking at. I, I won't go in. The scale and size of the patients in diabetes trials are generally about 20 to 50. Okay? There's a nice bell-shaped curve someone could do, which is out of all the clinical trials, huh, take neurofibromatosis. You know, how many patients are in these trials that are, and I'm not talking about for a drug, I'm talking about for understanding this or that. Um, so N is a problem. We've got to figure out a way to go two orders of magnitude bigger in N. Second is we have to have something where we have serial measurements so that we can look at different contexts. So T refers to time. D has to do with the dimensions. You would like to have thousands of dimensions when you're taking those intervals of time that, that could be continuous, and you want to be ha doing that on tens to hundreds of thousands of people. And the M is, it needs to be machine readable, okay? One of the big problems is you can't go, uh, despite what some people think, and 
sort of filter out from electronic medical records all the things that were in there because when someone says fatigue or someone says uh, some element of uh, a rash, everyone means something different. So imagine, can you build a way where you have a machine readable way with a thousand plus dimensions continuous in a hundred thousand people, okay? So what, that's what led us to going, how can we use smartphones to be able to accomplish that? You may also have heard that 80% of the world's population will have a smartphone, 80% in uh, six years, okay? That's probably going to get shorter, 80%. So that's five billion people are going to be out there with smartphones, okay? That, that's the starting uh, quotient from which we start. If you look at the measurements by which someone does a clinical trial and you look at how they're done with those pen and paper surveys or put in and you look at what you could do on smartphones in terms of how sensitive, how objective, how continuous, how individual centered, remote, etc., cetera, it, it, it's just uh, not worth discussing. Three years ago, um, coming on four, I'll have to say four soon, um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, funded us to basically do a project we called Democratizing Medicine. And, uh, and the project basically said, what if we were to say that anyone who had a disease was on the verge of being in a trial? A everyone who has a disease is on the verge of being in a trial healthy people, similarly, and that their data and wisdom are what you're trying to capture. Right? Not, not coming in through someone who's going to assess them, but saying, why can't I do it directly from individuals? And how could you, uh, how could you pull that off? So the model that we put together was um, something that is not PICORI, right? even though some of those words are in there, but to say, participant-centered, maybe even participant-driven. Right? Well, how do you get to a point where someone who's living with the disease is an equal partner with the researcher? And how do you send the loops of information flowing so that you don't uh, find yourself in sort of spectacular flame-outs of small ideas that are not not tied back? So what you want is you want this integrated in a way where the energy, the passion, the ideas are able to be helping uh, multiple people. We think that, that is, in that system, it's possible to go from anecdotes to signals. Because what you really want to know is if I eat a banana or I don't run or I am not getting enough sleep, does something that someone else found apply to me? So actually what I'm really excited by is how do you take end of one experiments and figure out what context allows that to be reflected to another, okay? Because if you figure that out, okay, then you're getting knowledge without you doing it. Okay? So this is a really beautiful concept if you can figure out when that applies to me. So um, six months ago and uh, 10 days, um, we had been working pretty closely uh, with, uh, with uh, Apple. I had been uh, spending some significant time uh, inside of Apple while working at, uh, at Sage. And uh, on, on, uh, on March 10th, the first attempt to do something along these lines came out um, called Research Kit. So Research Kit is an Apple project that said, can we build apps that aren't self-gratifying health kit apps, but actually are about trying to pull communities together, get information, and share that data and come up with insights. Um, and uh, so we helped with the one that was here at Stanford and uh, in diabetes and MGH. There was one in cardiovascular there, um, one a beautiful one at Mount Sinai at asthma. But we did worked on two of them, one about breast cancer survivors that I'm not going to talk about, and the other one about um, Parkinson, which you'll see why I am going to talk about it. So we called this M Power, um, and uh, what, what we basically started from is this. The patients who get said, I have Parkinson disease, go off a description of symptoms that was done by James in 1817, and you get diagnosed whether you do or do not have Parkinson by taking those attributes that are in that original diagnosis and matching to those. So our question was, could you actually track real-time information in a disease? What would it look like? 
Are there real day-to-day -day variations, week-to-week, uh, 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 -week, day-to-day variations? Um, could we unpack the symptoms into more important information? Uh, could we use tracking uh, to uh, figure out uh, from these sensors to get more sensitive descriptions? And then finally, as you'll see, can we figure out who's make, who's, what's making certain people better, what's making them, them worse? So we took a very simple approach. We said, let's look at motor, let's look at gait, let's look at hypophonia, soft voice, and let's look at memory. And let's build a vertical stack that takes us from anchored uh, structured or sorry, anchored surveys that everyone agrees with, build in structured tasks that are a couple of times a day or five times a day, and then let's put in a passive layer, which we want to eventually get to where we never ask anyone anything. Right? So can we build a device that starts with the hardcore questions on the bottom, structured tasks where you define what you're trying to look at, and then on top make it such that can uh, one of these smartphones actually tell when you're shifting from one disease state to another without, ta without asking you. Right? That, that, that's, that's the goal. So you build those vertical stacks. We have all these data feeds. If there are people interested, I can go through sort of the features in them. Um, you can download the app. It's actually also... Um, poised to be downloaded from the App Store in the Netherlands, Peter. Um, but you can um, uh, do the tapping interval test. There's a phonation test saying, ah, you can follow gait and balance. I'm not going to go through those. And there's a memory test in there. It's been six months uh, since we started the project. Um, Within days, we had more patients than anyone had ever had in a, in a Parkinson trial. We now have almost 60,000, it probably is by now, 60,000 downloads. Um, a lot of those were those voyeurs, but there were 15,000 plus uh, participants. Um, and in that set, um, there were about 1,500 patients. Very interesting that there were that many people who didn't have a disease who wanted to be a part of this and have stayed in it. All these controls, we have about 1,500 uh, uh, patients. And this is the most important part so far in this uh, talk. We wanted to make that data available so that other people could use it before publication. So uh, John Wilbanks and Christine Suver put in, uh, with a lot of help from the group at Apple, um, a sense that said, you know, every person who uses this app should own that data. We're giving you that. That's your data, right? We're not taking it, that. You own the data, and you have two choices. If you want that data going to the study investigator for the problem, let us know. But if you're interested in uh, taking that and allowing that data to be available to any qualified researcher worldwide, we'll make that available because we could host it on Synapse. 78%, somewhere between... 75, 80% of the patients said, hey, I want to share it with, with, all, with anyone, anywhere. So we now have across all the first five apps, 70 to 80,000 people's records now that are being, have been consent, that allow people to go in and, and do work, and you don't have to talk to the original PI, and you don't have to hear, oh, my postdoc's almost ready to let that out of the lab, right? It's like extremely important to do that and make that available so people can do that right away. Uh, the total volume is pretty uh, interesting. I don't know if you can read this, but um, usually a physician sees a patient maybe every two to six months. All their observations add up to 60. For Empower, for each of those 1,500 patients, we have a half million data points on those uh, individuals. So it's just, it's just a different time, right? It's that time, it's that you know, number, time, dimensions, machine, all machine readable. So for tapping, we can go in, have someone looking at uh, their tapping, which is a combination of tremor and other things. And um, this is a chart, no one had ever been able to do this before, where every one of those uh, little blinds has what was their disease before they took their drug and what happened to it afterwards. So we can track what was their disease when they started every day, what was the shift. Some days they go down, some, but look at the fluctuation in that. And you should be asking yourself, what kind of noise is that? Because right? that's very noisy. Okay. Well, what, what's causing that? Um, between every exam like that, there are 40, in this particular one, we have 43 dimensions of data that we <coughs> capture from the person uh, tapping. So we can actually go out, and that's first order, then we can build second order uh, ways of looking at it. But we have all these data so that we can do the following. Here's a man and a woman 
They're tapping um, in, in various ways, but if you can see, there's some significant benefit uh, in, the, in the man in terms of the uh, L-topa. They're saying in the woman, for the tapping number, you can't see that. So our scientists went back and we said, pull out of all those dimensions the dimension of uh, symptom that most changed when you gave the drug. And what you, say, uh, what you see is in the uh, male patient, um, it was number of taps. In the woman, it actually had to do with the tremor that was going away. So we think you can build personalized classifiers that match the person at that time in their disease and look at what's going on and, and just have that so, so people, instead of saying, what happened in the last three months, Susan, right? You, and you have no idea, what do you tell the physician? Well, it's been a pretty good three months. Um, you know, it's so much of a different dialogue between a patient and a physician when you have that, that level of detail. But the thing that blew us away, the thing that actually made this whole thing worth doing, was every day we asked people, are you um, feeling better? Are you feeling worse? And if so, why? Okay. So instead of just talking about the disease, we were interested in the modulators. We now have close to 20,000 responses. And yes, medication is there. Sleep is there, but what blew our minds was that for better and worse, it ends up being stress. It ends up being my dog was hurt. I went and bought a new bed, and we could map the Ferguson event in Missouri by people's Parkinson's disease. We could see, so, so here's this race relations in, in America. We could see that come rippling across, okay? People don't realize how our own lives are so connected with what's making us better and what's making us worse. Whether it's an inflammatory disease, an infectious disease, whether someone's going to respond to a transplant, I'm convinced that there are all these micro insults and things that are going along that we just haven't been able uh, to, to follow. So what we've been trying to do is figure out how can we influence uh, clinical practice to go from diseases to symptoms to, to syndromes to symptoms to features. I'm going to zip through this and just you can see that what we're building is ways for when you go to the doctor, you get to every day look at what's happening to your voice, your tapping, you have these different uh, scores. It's talking with you. It's your friend. <laughs> it's saying, I, right, this is me. This is what's uh, happening. I'm going to skip this. This is cool stuff. Um, and go to three so I can get to the last uh, thing that I want to talk about. Um, so precision medicine has a sense that if we use genomics, we could find subtypes. I think it could. But what we really have not done is looked at diseases, um, uh, whether it's schizophrenia or Alzheimer's or um, arthritis, at the fluctuations that are really going on in someone's lives. And we think that if you could actually unpack all those symptoms now onto that scale between the genotypic data and the phenotypic data, if you had really good data, you might do a better job of being able to sort out what patient needed what uh, uh, drug at what time. And there's an article that I just wrote on, on this, uh, an editorial that just came out. So this is the phrase that we're beginning to use now. I think you've heard of actionable mutations in cancer, which again I said I'm not sure how good they are. Um, but imagine a role for actionable phenotypes, where you're able to have such rich information about the phenotype, maybe enriched by genotypes, that you could start finding what's in common across individuals who are ha having what are supposedly a uh, different disease. So in that, in your area, right, imagine you had this way of tracking the particular symptom and not saying it's NF2 or it's this or it's that, but it's actually coming directly up for machine readable uh, um, features. We think that indications for therapies and interventions that are not bounded by disease designations, which is how things are approved right now, would have a very interesting implication on the speed by which the rare diseases, which often don't get a chance to get the benefit of the uh, more uh, common diseases, could all get the benefit. If they're sharing uh, actionable phenotype, why can't you just share that across? Right? Why can't you have some way where that's uh, having some way of being uh, lateral? Um, last week, I was at uh, um, uh, IBM, just opened a center in uh, Cambridge. 
they're building Watson to be a deep learning engine um, and are very interested in, in uh, health. I have to point out that they have been kind enough to partner with us with uh, significant resources to stabilize the open biomedical research platform. So up until now, we've been building Synapse and we have, I don't know, 20,000 or whatever uh, sets of data that are on there. But this interaction between IBM and Sage, similar to some of the other open systems that they supported, is giving us a stability for what Synapse could be that I think will, will uh, help us. I was gonna put in a note about the fact that if there are people here or are listening, who uh, think they want to live in a really crazy way, um, for the first time we're increasing the size of, of the group. Uh, about one in a hundred people who apply get in, but we're really looking for uh, very smart, crazy people who are interested in uh, blowing up the way things are. And if you are that type of person, all these people you know, started doing something else. So uh, Arno here was a Caltech undergraduate. He went, uh, learned Japanese and went and did design in Japan. Then he came back and in his uh, you know, back room was building 3D uh, or new versions of holograms. Got interested in brain imaging. You may know Arno, but uh, he's an example of the type of people that um, I think fit in with what we're doing. So now to the last little bit. And this was all the lead into what I'm worrying about. Digital information should trump the tragedy of the uh, commons. That's why we started working on it. What I mean by that is the normal tragedy of the commons has it such that if all your sheep and you have too many sheep are going to eat the grass and therefore one person impacts another. Okay? The tragedy of the commons is li linked to a scarcity of resources. There is no reason why digital information should have that element of scarcity. It doesn't cost you anything when you are using that data to let a million other people look at it. It does not cost you anything to let other people look at it. Right? And so the new digital commons, what I'm worried is that it may be crushed by a new tragedy of the digital commons that is, has to do with sequestering data that could flow that it may be that it begins to be locked up by first movers, quasi-monopolies, into information empires. And if you think about it, that's sort of what happens at Google, that's sort of what happens at, 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 at Facebook. So if you haven't read this book, uh, it's worth looking, if you're interested in this, it's called, this is Tim Wu's The Master Switch, about open and close, the rise and fall of information uh, empires. So what I would like you to compare and to contrast is the difference between a generative open system of health information. Imagine the type of data that we're building in. People have consented to have it available, and insights can be layered on that. And I'd like to call that a biomedical knowledge expert or knowledge expert versus one that's run as a quasi-monopoly. So a quasi-monopoly would be uh, some group comes in and says, I am going to build a tool that if you use my tool and you extract it, I'm going to keep that information and I'm going to return it to someone for a fee. So if, a, if you go to a venture capitalist now, they're almost stupid to turn down that idea. Okay, so here's the problem. There is so much money to be made in the health system by offering someone a cheaper way because right now it's done so poorly that what I'm worried is going to happen is people are going to begin to go to proprietary mechanisms or a group like Kaiser or some university or some there is going to go, we have the system and start having a need in order to make money to say, I can't share really what I'm doing. Uh, I'm the new Medtronics, da 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 right? And what is that going to do um, to uh, society? So, so then basically, what is needed? What sort of movement is there? Um, in 09, as beautifully stated by a doctor, this phrase I really like is a post capitalist society would have to be a knowledge society. So that's what, that's what uh, this person said. He also said, a new citizen culture must be disseminated among the public, a citizen science developed in order pr to prevent that. So that is why it's so important to have a citizen science uh, movement. Now, I don't know if you, anyone knows what I'm referring to, but 09 is 1909. And 1909, was when Alexander Bogdanov, 
who was one of the 22 members of the original Bolshevism group with Lenin there, um, wrote a book that I recommend you look at called Red Star. It's a dystopian uh, story in which um, he describes um, the benefit of where you have a a, a, enough of an equilibrium between knowledge and what's going on that issues of supply and demand do not have to be solved by the market economy. The market economy is in some ways a <coughs> relatively high efficient way, but some could argue not a very high efficiency. But if you had a knowledge expert that actually was able to know where was supply, where was demand, the point that he made, which as he said was on Mars, <laughs> flew off to Mars, they found this, um, that um, that is a way of looking at the benefit of having that free flow of information. So I brought that up because it's in a book that's not yet published in the, in the States. Uh, I picked it up in Europe called Post-Capitalism, A Guide to Our Future. And what I am wondering is whether our society right now, fueled by capitalism, has incentives and rewards that are going to make it such that we opt for a short uh, delivery of some benefits to society at a cost that's similar to generic drugs, takes something that's currently very expensive to do, does it with something that's very, very cheap as a solution to as an alternative, and people start paying so much or, or charging so much for that, that all of this free information that's flowing around that allows us to do things is going to get sequestered. And so in in an effort to have a short return <laughs> to society, what we're going to lose is a scenario where the long tail gets served, <laughs> where the new insights are flowing, and I want people to think about what's the chance that that is, is going to happen. So I'm going to end there. Um, I did want to tell you that uh, March 25th uh, to the 27th, uh, we're going to be in China. The next sage assembly is. And uh, the Greek philosophers know thyself phrase, um, Socrates uh, phrase, know thyself, know your home. We're going to do an open uh, assembly there on the environment. We're going to do what would happen if you had allowed citizens to have real-time data on what was going to in themselves, in the environment, and we're putting together a classic uh, you know, sage assembly, but it's not going to be about the classic uh, biomedicine as much as it is it's going to be about uh, the impact of, on the environment and how can citizens uh, tackle that problem because it's so much related to health. Thanks very much.